Ladies and gentlemen, today on the program, uh, getting real and healthy with Tanya Marie Harris. Now, you know, kids, how fascinated I am with people who make big changes in their lives, and I've had a few of them on this show. I'm thinking of Sarah Smith. I'm thinking of Chris Banks. I'm thinking of Al the Yeti Bones. These are people who. Life came along and said, it's time for you to stop this behavior. It's time for you to change this way of thinking. It's time for you to change this way of living. And they've heard that call and answered that call and are better off for it. Today, we have Tanya Marie Harris, who has done the same thing. Now, a bit of background here, okay? When I first met her, when I interviewed her for my music blog, she was Tanya Marie Harris. Nashville artist, country singer, playing around all the time, doing really, really well. And then one day, Tanya Marie Harris popped up and announced she was done. She was packing it in, and then she disappeared. And we didn't hear from her again for a long time, until suddenly, just as suddenly, she popped up again. No longer Tanya Marie Harris, country recording artist, but Tanya Marie Harris, coach. Coach at Ritual Life Artistry, her business, and for me, well, that twigs right away because I wondered where she had gone to, and then when she pops up again and starts talking about making healthy diet choices and changing our life and begins to tell a bit of the fascinating story behind the story. And it is fascinating, and she has completely reinvented herself from a country singer into a life coach, and she's going to tell us all about how destructive the life she was living was. And when the call finally came for her to change, some of the steps that she took to do it. And it is a fascinating story. Now, I got to tell you... This is a bit of slice of life, because we're all under quarantine still here. We're still self-isolating, and so it was when I interviewed her. So what you get is Tanya in her house, surrounded by her family, which is isolated with her. So we got the kid, and we got the husband, and we got the dog barking and the cat meowing. And so it's a little bit as though we're sitting in her kitchen with her. So just a straight-up warning. Some of the audio is uh, a little bit dicey, uh, but, you know, you get a flavor of her life, which is kind of cool. Now, I want to give a shout out to my boy, Denny, Denny Goche out there. He and I are working on some stuff right now. We can't unveil it yet, but I think I can get him to take just two seconds away from his busy schedule to reach on over here and roll intro. Listening to the John Huff podcast. Oh, oh yeah! Oh, 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 oh. How are you, Coach Tanya Marie Harris? I am lovely, thank you. I didn't know what we'd be talking exactly about today, so I'm just kind of open to what's going to happen. Good. Oh, and you might you might hear my cat and or dog. <laughs> you know, it just de- depends. Uh, the cat can be quite ornery. He's an old man who is grumpy that we have a puppy. <laughs> Ah, uh, cats will do that. Yeah, I lock. I have three cats, and I lock them all out, all out of my little studio. You can't come you have in because they'd be all over me, and all over the microphone, and jumping in and out of the window, and fighting with each other. And maybe that, maybe that is compelling listening. People love cats. People do love cats. Have you seen the uh, the uh, the curve chart that's out there about you know like combating this virus that we're dealing with? Uh, someone's turned it into two kitty cats. Really? And they said, people really love cats, so maybe this chart will now make sense to people. <laughs> I thought that was funny. It's really, it's really compelling to watch the way people are handling this, you know? Like, some people are losing it, 
And I kind of understand that. And some people are turning out really funny memes. I think that humor, it's never too soon to laugh at what's happening. It reduces your stress totally. I think uh, we're, you know, a lot of people could really use some more humor around this for sure. I'm not saying it's a laughing matter, not in the slightest, but if we don't, if we don't laugh about these things, you know, you, you do just create more anxiety for yourself. Yeah. And it's not like there's any shortage of things to create anxiety about this. Exactly. Like I was in, I'm sequestered right now because I was in Mexico a week ago and we got, we came home on Thursday, which is the day I think things really began to ramp up. And it's amazing how quickly I began to sense the anxiety just everywhere. As soon as I landed in the country and started driving, I turned on the radio and whoosh, a, a week's worth of relaxation gone. It's just everything was so amplified. It's like, wow, what is happening here? So if you're prone to anxiety, and I tend to be, these have got to be troubling times, I would think. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And the thing is, too, is um, I, I think that uh, media doesn't help anything um, it, it, the way it's been blown up. For me, I didn't really think too much of it until they announced, you know, they were tacking on a couple of weeks to the kids March break. They were closing schools down and that has never happened uh, before. And so that's when I realized that something was definitely, you know, going on very serious. I mean, we, we knew it was happening around um, and it's been quite some time, but until it affects you personally, you know, uh, it doesn't, oh, that's the bell of my dog who wants to go out. It's all right. My <laughs> husband will take care of it. We've trained our little puppy to ring a bell to go outside. We're so getting, sorry about that. We're getting slice of life for Tammy Marie Harris here. Yes, absolutely. I believe in trained dogs. <laughs> great, great. But, uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah, I didn't realize that it was a serious situation until that point. And I think, um, uh, it's funny you mentioned how people take different types of anxiety because, um, for me, I am not anxious over it at all. Um, I'm perfectly content in my little world here. I don't mind being isolated away. Um, I'm quite the homebody, um, even though I know that, uh, you know, to a lot of people, I'm very much an extrovert, but I really am very much mostly at peace quietly and alone. And, um, but what I do feel anxiety over is I can feel other people's anxiety. So we went to Costco, foolish people that we are. Can't do that. Uh, yeah, it was a mistake. And it was on, on, on Friday. And uh, the lineup to get into the store, first off, was a big alarm bell. Uh, watching what people had in their carts was an alarm bell. Um, and that's when I realized that people were, were hoarding when there's absolutely no need for that. Um, it's not like they, the food manufacturing industry, the highly profitable food manufacturing industry, you know, um, is going to stop producing. It's not going to happen. So, you know, Dempster's isn't going to stop making bread. But if, if people just only bought what they needed for a week, then there'd be some for everybody else. It's just so shocking. So that's what's raising people's anxiety, too, is they feel the need to have something um, which they could easily have, but it's not there. It's so... It's, it's unfortunate the behavior that's happening. It is. Um, and I think, hey, we're hoarding toilet paper and yeah. cleaning products. Like, I, I don't, it's, it just seems so bizarre to me the things that people began to fixate on, right? Like, cleaning products, wh who's coming into your, like, wh wh what are you planning to clean and for how long with all of this stuff? Like, it just seemed, I think probably people want to exert some sort of control. Absolutely. It's chaos, so we're going to control what we can, which means we're going to feel better because we got all this supplies. Well, and you know, I think that that speaks, though, to a bigger problem, which is that we've absolutely given up responsibility for our own lives to corporations and to, you know, so we no longer look after, you know, gathering our own food and growing our own food. We no longer, um, you know, have cold storage for things. We no longer, you know, we depend on the electricity to keep the fridge on, you That's know, true. and so we've really given up 
given up a lot of our control. And so I feel like hopefully this is um, a good wake up call for people to, you know, find other ways to look after themselves that doesn't involve hoarding, first of all, the wrong things. Right. Um, right? You know, because I walked into Walmart um, I had to get some kitty and some puppy food. Of course. And <laughs> and um, shockingly, um, there was a huge abundance of beautiful fruits and vegetables just sitting there yep. right for the picking. Yep. And yet I walked a few aisles down and all the oatmeal is gone. All the pasta is gone. All the grains are gone. And it's just those aren't the things that are going to... Uh, help your body. First of all, like with anxiety, you need good nutrition, right? So uh, you need those fruits and vegetables. Um, but it also boosts your immune system. Um, having right. those, well, actually, that's kind of a misnomer. It, you can't really boost your immune system. You can give your immune system what it needs to function properly. Right. right. And right. so most people are lacking that and they're going right for the stuff that's going to make it worse. And so we don't eat for today. We eat for next week. And so if you're not eating the fruits and vegetables right now, your immune system next week is going to suck. So good luck to you. Right. Uh, that information wasn't people should know this, I suppose. But a lot of information was just not made available and probably still isn't. Uh, it it took almost a week for somebody in a position of power to just come out and say, "Calm down." Yeah. <laughs> Let alone here are ways to look after your anxiety with nutrition. Like we haven't even reached that level yet. So, uh, it's it's been really crazy. But we'll do this podcast and we'll release it, and hopefully, you know, it will help. I hope so. <laughs> I did when I asked you to do this. I. None of this had happened yet, so I didn't anticipate talking about a global pandemic. You but never hey, know. We got to talk about what's what the subject is right now, right? Yeah, and uh, and you're a person who has some insight on this. But when I first interviewed you, I don't know, four or five years ago for the London Groove Machine blog, you were yes. touring country Nashville artist Tanya Marie Harris. I was. And today I'm talking to Coach Tanya Marie Harris. Now tell us, what happened? Well, I, it's very easy to tell you what happened. Um, uh, well, and as a musician yourself, you know that uh, touring isn't exactly easy on your body. Um, and then you throw in some very poor lifestyle habits. Uh, and my health just deteriorated uh, rapidly. Um, and so. And when I say rapidly, I mean, there was some disgusting, horrible symptoms that I was putting up with. And, and you know what, I'll just, I'll go ahead and put myself out there because I want people to understand um, just how much a poor lifestyle can affect your body. Um, I was in Michigan um, about to open. I was the direct opener for Low Cash mm -hmm. and I was super excited. Uh, we pulled up and there's their big tour bus. And of course, I'm in my little <laughs> crappy van, yes, right? Yes, you like, are, man. Van. Just yes, like I me. Am. You bet. <laughs> right? Exactly. <laughs> and um, here's what happened. I stepped out of my van and crapped my pants. No way. Literally. Oh, wow. Right down. Now, I was able to get myself to the green room. I was able to do everything before anybody knew anything was up. And no, I was very able to disguise that I was getting sicker and sicker and sicker as time went on. And what happened was, is that um, I had dealt with all my anxiety issues for the most part. I had lots of tools and things like that. But as my health declined, my anxiety came back and started to rise and started to rise because I became fearful of the symptoms. Sure. And, and it just created this horrible cycle, which then made me fear being on stage because, well, I mean, what could happen? What could go wrong? Am I going to pass out on the stage? You know, um, and also you can't deliver. You cannot deliver anything of quality, whether they think it's quality or not. It's like inside yourself. You cannot deliver anything amazing if you are sick and fearful. It is just not possible. And so I had been responsible for my band. As you know, I did my very best to work with just a solid group of 
uh, musicians. I, I didn't really use piece players. Um, and so I felt extremely responsible to them sure. for their employment. We had got ourselves up to doing um, somewhere between 100 and 120 shows a year, which, you know, I think for where I was at was amazing. It mm -hmm. was a complete success. Um, and um, but being responsible for their employment, I knew if I told them, because we we're so close, if I told them how sick I was, they would have made me stop. Right. They would have made me stop immediately. So instead, I basically stopped slowly. I said, guys, I'm going to have to stop, you know, family requirements. I gave them the usual BS that you would probably give anybody about, you know, excuses and said, but I'm going to give you lots of time. I'm going to give you six months notice. So, you know, I pushed through six months of being sick. I went to the hospital. I had to wake my guys up in Chicago and say, this is when they realized something was wrong, though. At this point, I had to wake them up at uh, it was four o'clock in the morning. We'd been asleep for an hour. Well, I had not been asleep, but I was in excruciating pain. And I said, nope, we're going home. I don't care that I got insurance here in the States. I'm not staying here to go to no hospital. Let's go home. And I went home and went to the hospital. And that's so, a long drive in, in, in pain. <laughs> it is. And actually, that's the time that I first experienced ever in my life projectile vomiting. I never knew it was a real thing. I mean, I, you'd hear of it. And of course, you watch the Family Guy episodes where they're seriously vomiting all over the place, right? But right. I didn't really believe that that was an actual thing until that day. And what's worse is I'm like, guys, guys, I need a bag. I need a bag, right? And so Rody Dave, he, he hands me a grocery bag, but no one checked the bag first, right? Uh -oh. And so, oh yeah, there I am, projectile vomiting. It was such a forceful thing that it went through the bag into my beautiful purse and ruined a great bag. I'll never forget that. Anyways, um, so yeah, it was a really a rough ride home. <laughs> and I, so I had that experience recently, the the food poisoning thing. Yeah. So we did eight hours from southern Illinois to London. Probably wow. probably roughly the same as your Chicago yeah. trip. Uh yeah, that's not fun. At least I didn't have now I know the story. You had a kidney stone. Yes. I did not have that. So I didn't have the pain to go with, but I can put myself in your shoes and that is not, not fun. No. And actually I'd, I'd had a kidney stone, um, you know, many, many years before a tiny little thing, you know, um, that, yeah, it definitely was pro you know troublesome, but was not like this. And then this one came from severe dehydration, like consistent severe dehydration, uh, and too much of, uh, a good thing. I don't know, coffee. You know, I was uh, obsessed with my coffee because I became so fearful of eating anything because of the uh, other issues I was having. Sure. So I wouldn't eat anything before a show, but I would drink a coffee for goodness sakes for my energy, right? So you can imagine there I am not eating all day, drinking my coffee though, um, Starbucks to boot, you know, really terrible on the intestines for sure. And, uh, and then, yeah, doing my show. And then where do you eat after the show? You eat at McDonald's, baby. Hell yeah, you do. Mm -mm. I'd always get my uh, 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 the bacon cheeseburger, basically, or the McDouble with bacon, yeah, and uh, and and my coffee, another coffee, oh, because man. of course we had to drive home, right? right? And I'm always trying to make it home to get to my daughter sure. in between a lot of this stuff, and so um, basically my body just gave out on me, and so I kind of went into hiding for a year, maybe actually two, I feel it was two years um, after coming off the road. And, um, but during that time, I had already been working with um, some young songwriters and other uh, musicians in their performance, um, helping them to um, feel comfortable in their own skin and create rapport and relax themselves. And, uh, and so that, um, you know, really uh, shone a light on where I, think I'm meant to be. I, I really believe that my life has come full circle and I no longer, um, or I guess I should say, I now feel that um, I was always meant to be in service. Hmm, interesting. Yeah. Um, did you have any sort of diagnosis on where you were at when you came off the road or was it just general unhealth causing awful symptoms? Now, this is where I don't want to tell anybody anything. Because you, don't, you don't have to either. Oh, no, I'm going to because I want people to not be the same way. Um, I was so fearful. Um, I was so afraid that there was something severely wrong with me that I refused to go to the doctors, aside from when I went to the hospital and whatnot. And then and, and it, I'd been there a couple of times. But um, 
when it came to actually all the other symptoms that I had been having, I, I didn't want to go. I was scared. And so I, I didn't. And so what I instead started to do was look up people who had changed their health. And um, I started looking for a program that I could do privately. So because I'm a very private person. And, um, and again, I didn't want to hear from a doctor. And so that's when I found um, a program called Wild Fit. Mm-hmm. It's actually designed by a Canadian. His name is Eric Edmeads. He's a fantastic guy. Um, the Canadian government actually just gave him a medal like a month or two ago, maybe a few months ago right. for the work that he's doing. Yeah. And, um, and so I did this health program and my entire life changed really? completely. Um, and I'd never been able to do that before. One, I'd never like stuck to a diet before, even though I wanted to, right? I was kind of self-conscious being on stage. I wasn't, I wasn't comfortable in my own skin. I was usually self-conscious about the way I looked. I didn't look the part, you know, all sorts of things. And um, yeah, it really took me through incremental change where I gained confidence and new abilities in my health. And that got me really focused on um, the positive things that it did for my anxiety issues. And so I decided that I had to add all of that into how I was helping my, my artists um, was add some health um, because you cannot have a great performance without great health. So how was your health at this point in time? <sighs> this point in time, it's like night and day. I know that I have an extremely strong immune system. Um, I know that, um, you know, anything that could happen, uh, you know, in the next few weeks, you know, what if there was a real food shortage, an actual food shortage, you know, of the fruits and vegetables and things. And I know that um, my body has stored all of that nutrients that I've been eating and I am okay. Yeah. So my stress is, you know, pretty low when it comes to worry right now over it. How hard was it for you to make the decision to stop touring? You know, As a musician yourself, you know how important the music is. You know how it makes you feel inside. You know, it gives you, it's like breathing. If you can't do it, what's the point of living? Hmm. You know, there's, you're not going to. Um, And because I felt that way about singing my entire life, um, I honestly just believed that being on stage was where I was supposed to be. And even though I didn't like the idea of being on the stage, I didn't like uh, being the center of attention um, I, the idea of leading professional musicians when I felt like a fraud myself for a lot of it was not cool. Right. Mm. Um, but I, um, so coming off the road was a lot easier for me, I think, than it would be for some people in the sense that I really realized that it was just for me. I never needed the audience. I never needed to be on that stage. I just assumed that that's what was expected. Hmm. that's what I started to expect of myself when I was younger, even, but my anxiety was too strong, like even through my twenties to even try. So. Well, I mean, I do love the story of when you decided to, because that was when you were going to have a daughter. Yeah. And most people quit when they're going to have a daughter, (laughs) not start when they're going to have a daughter. Always the anomaly. I know I can't help myself. I I like to. (laughs) I love that though. Well, tell us about this. Tell us about that motivation in the beginning. Well, um, there I am with my new little daughter and, uh, we had put her in gymnastics and, uh, she was, uh, she was very physical. She didn't talk when she was uh, very little. So she was very physical. It's usually one way or the other. And so we put her in gymnastics and there she was walking along the little, little, you know, one inch balance beam that's made of foam. (laughs) And I thought, Oh, what if she wants to be a gymnast? Oh, an Olympic gymnast, you know, but then that got me thinking, you know, how, how do I expect her to do anything that she wants to do in this world or follow any dreams that, you know, she has, if I never followed mine. Um, and so, yeah, I just, I started doing some research and I said, I think I'm just going to go to Nashville and, and uh, record a couple of songs and maybe that'll be enough for me. Right. And um, then that turned into coming home and putting a band together. And and then, you know, that turned into, well, let's see if I can get these songs on the radio. And it just, you know, it just blew up. And and again, with my anxiety, I really had to know as much as I could about each performance, which is why I wouldn't work with peace players. I needed to know that everything was kosher. 
Sure. At every time. Anyway, so yeah, that's sort of how it happened. And then I have a dog barking. Welcome to my world. <laughs> okay. There we go. Husband's coming to rescue me from All the puppy. Right. Awesome. There we are. There that's we great. are. The problem is the cat was in the room. So I can see it back there. Yes. Yes. That's yeah. my old guy. Hello. His name's Dewey. How old's Dewey? Uh, he is almost 18. Oh, wow. We had, yeah. a we had a 19-year-old, so yeah, they can live a long time. Yeah. Do we? <laughs> so that's, that's, that's how I got into the whole music thing, was I, I, I had ignored it my entire life because I was too uh, afraid of the spotlight. I was uh, fearful I wasn't good enough. Uh, well, to me, I was never good enough even when I was doing it. Um, now is a whole different ballgame. Really? It's not that I feel I'm good enough now, it's that I've accepted my love of singing for myself right and that i do it in my kitchen all the time i do it in my shower i sing in my car and it makes me just as happy as it ever did wow yeah and there's really only a few times that i can point out on stage where i really felt amazing hmm. because i was always generally worried about people's perceptions and was I coming off the right way? Oh, geez. Are people actually going to show up to this gig? You know, lots of stuff like that. I know that one. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting though. You, you talked about, you felt like this is what you were supposed to do. Like it seemed like a natural thing. And then when you look at it in retrospect, yeah. it, it very literally almost killed you. It did. How many people do you think are doing things right now that they think they're supposed to do, and it's literally almost killing them? I think a lot of people are out there doing that. I think a lot of people uh, forget to look at you know their inner being about what they think and what they believe, um, and we're so focused and really unconsciously focused on on what other people expect from us. Hmm. That's a really destructive thing. It is. To people, like, in some cases, maybe you need to go through this thing is because it's a bridge to where you're actually supposed to be. It feels like that's happening to you right now because... It's the journey. What's, what's happening is, you know, maybe your purpose is to be this coach, this mentor, this person, and you needed this experience behind you to speak from, right? 100%. You know? Um, but I find it really compelling that there's probably people out there everywhere who are in this thing they're doing because they think they're supposed to, and it made sense. Yeah. And they're they're not stepping back and taking a, a look at the big picture. Like, are you happy? Are you healthy? Are you stressed out? And how much of that is a product of what you're doing right now? I'm really big on doing the thing that you're meant to do or that you want to do or that you're passionate about. I have trouble defining that for even for myself right now because I'm still throwing spaghetti at the wall. But I think it's an awfully unhealthy thing to be doing the wrong thing and, right. and ignoring how much that makes you ill mentally and physically. And I think that's why there's a big movement uh, right now of people really specifically not doing things that they don't want to do. They're really, it's a, it's a whole movement. I can't remember what they're calling it. It's like FOMO or something, um, you know, not, but it's about not doing things versus doing things. Yeah. There's a, there's a massive paradigm shift happening, but it, it, it has to be a shift of the way we think about everything, money, success. You know what I mean? Like it, it goes layers deep. Um, and I'm all for it, and I'm part of it, but I struggle too with like, this isn't working, that isn't working, but maybe you have to redefine what working means. I'm, I'm not sure. This is new for me too. Well, I have a question for you. Yeah, go for it. And, and, and this um, will kind of lead back into, I think, of my little circle story that I've got going on here. Sweet. But, um, you know, what, what is it you were really interested in when you were a kid? Is there something that really really made you passionate like as a kid teenager um i i had two enduring kind of things when i was younger one was books and one was music 
So today I am a writer and I'm a musician and I'm a podcaster. I'm just not particularly successful at any of those things yet. You know what I mean? Again, very subjective. Okay. By certain metrics that matter <laughs> to me, I'm not 100% successful, but I think about this all the time. Like I'm, I'm a, I'm, I think way too much actually about what I'm meant to do, what I want to do, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I mean, when I was a kid, I can remember leaning up against the speaker on my parents' massive record player. You know those old record players that were like a piece of furniture? I do. I, I remember leaning up against them, playing records, listening. And as a teenager, music was life. And I loved, like, I attached severely to books. So those were obviously my two main passions, interests, right? And I'm dancing all around them all the time. I mean, I am a working musician. I am a touring musician. Now, I struggle with all of the same self-doubt. My whole sort of online world exists because of self-doubt. This podcast is about that. Uh, my website and all the writing on it is about that. So I struggle with the same things that you did. Not so much performance anxiety, but imposter syndrome, self-doubt. Go on. You're raising I the finger. Yeah, I was just going to say that, though. Um, all of those are forms of performance anxiety, right? So mm -hmm. the fear of, you know, so I've, I've got, um, I, I was working with some writers recently in a, a writer's workshop. And, uh, you know, they, several of them have manuscripts in, the, in their trunks, but they, they won't do anything with them. They won't let people read them. Of course. And, and, and the reason is, is because they identify so much with the work that they put into it, right? Mm -hmm. They they can't disassociate themselves. And so therefore, if they've put it out there um, for someone to criticize, you know, it takes a it's a big hit on their ego. And so they're it, it's just an unconscious way of protecting themselves, which is what performance anxiety is. It's just a it's a way of protecting yourself. Sure. It's letting you know there's something wrong, right? Yeah. And so when you when you have um you know self-doubt um, it truly, it absolutely can be a form of performance anxiety because you're maybe prejudging yourself of what you're putting out there. You're judging the future before it happens. Yeah. Or maybe you're judging it too based on past experiences or worse, your inner critic, right? And so, yeah, absolutely. And so it's all, it all kind of comes together as, as a little mini forms of performance anxiety. And I think also, certainly in my case, and this is, this is, its own virus these days is this comparing yourself to other people, right? So I'm a drummer and the online world is full of people who can play insane things. And so it's very easy to compare yourself to those people and think, well, I obviously don't meet the standard. Now you and I both know, and you are a band leader, that a lot of that insane stuff they play, if it came into your song, you would fire those people. Yeah. But, you know, there's a certain pressure to be X, Y, Z. And, and as a performer, you need to learn to value what you do bring. You need to see the strength in your own game, whatever yes. it happens to be. That doesn't mean don't improve where you need to, but you need to learn to value yourself and what you do bring, which has been a lesson for me over the past couple of years, for sure. And I can tell you... Proudly, as a writer, I have not been shy about submitting my manuscripts for rejection, and I have the rejections to show for it. Beautiful. <laughs> it, it was the same thing when I first started to book myself. Right. That's another form of performance anxiety. Sure is, is. that I was try getting on the phone, and God help me, trying to explain it to a young artist that you should actually call people if you want to get booked. But that's another story. Uh -huh. um, but I, I would have these like small little panic attacks when I first started. Oh yeah. And and then um, what it takes though is going out there and say to yourself before you do it, I'm about to get rejected. I'm okay with that because it's going to get easier. It's and you say it out loud. That's right. Yeah. And so the more I got rejected, the easier it became. So uh, what I love to tell people is go and expect to be rejected, but expect it. Because if you expect yeah. it, it's not as hard on your ego, which you're, then your, your body doesn't have to protect you against, right? It's exposure therapy too, right? Yes. Right? It's the same thing as performing. 
like generally speaking, um, when I got back into music, because I was out of music for a very long time, when I got back into music, the first show I played was one of the most stressful experiences of my whole life. And it seemed so strange to me at the time. Like, what? why am I afraid of this? I've performed lots and lots, but it had been years and years. And then you play that first show and then you realize, oh yeah, this is fun. I forgot. And then over time, like it, it's no big deal for me to go out in front of thousands of people and play. It doesn't happen often, but I've done it, you know? And that's a form of exposure therapy too. I mean, it's like things become easier the more you do them. And then you will get some wins too. You will get booked, right? You yep. will you will learn the language. You will learn how to present yourself, how to talk to a booker or club owner or whatever. And But you, you can't, that can't be theoretical. It has to be practical. You have to go through that experience in order to get better. And it's the same with anything. Yes. Being rejected on a manuscript. It's part of the game, man. You Going know? up to a manager asking for a raise. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Same thing there. Yeah. Like you, you can't think your way around that. You have to go through that experience, but it, it gets easier. <laughs> so that's good. <laughs> so what, what has changed in your diet? What's in your refrigerator right now, Coach Tanya Marie? Ooh, what's in my refrigerator? I got this... lots of, uh, lots of greens, lots yeah. of uh, cruciferous vegetables like uh, broccoli and cauliflower. Um, but there's also fruits and vegetables, like a fruits um, like a cantaloupe and raspberries and whatnot. But I eat very um, uh, seasonally, we'll say. I don't eat with our natural seasons because, you know, if that's the case, I think I would die in a Canadian winter, obviously. Yeah. Um, you know, but I do cycle my food and, and I try to keep a huge variety and change that variety um, often so that I'm uh, getting the nutrients that my body needs without having to buy any supplements. Are you eating meat? I do eat meat. Yeah. Yes. And I, I do believe that humans were meant to eat meat. Um, I know that some people will have a problem with that and that's okay. I'm not, I would like to suggest that um, I hope people will choose the highest quality of meat that they can, which would be a wild game, which they've had a natural life. Mm -hmm. They've not been pumped full of hormones and they're eating their natural um, diet. Right. And so, you know, I, I think that's the best way to get me. So if you have a choice between, you know, a hamburger and like a bison burger, I would right. probably go with the bison burger. Right. And, um, and so I do believe that humans were, were meant to eat meat. Do you think people understand how much their diet affects their life? Um, I think people are starting to, yeah. um, and, and, and again, I'm one that can absolutely say is it's, it's, I really didn't realize how much, uh, poor nutrition and poor choices can affect your body. I, I basically assume my body can deal with anything. And, you know, I was in my thirties and thinking still that I could just do as I pleased and, and be okay until I wasn't okay. So I think a lot of people are, um, especially with, you know, cancer and everything, there's a lot of people are really waking up to the fact that nutrition has a lot to do with recovery, has a lot to do with, uh, you know, prevention. Like I really live by the principle that it is far more important to get the things that you need nutritionally than get rid of the things that are junk. Hmm. So, you know, if you want the potato chips, eat the goddamn potato chips, but eat a salad too, will you? Like, and not just iceberg lettuce, like make it bitter green salad, you know, some nice deer tongue lettuce and, you know, Paris Island, things like that. Some really good greens and some kale and some spinach and yeah, get the good stuff in. It's more important than getting rid of the bad stuff. Is it simply a matter of convenience or is it a lack of knowledge that makes people not do this? That's a, that's a twofer. I think that's a both. I think, yeah. uh, it, unfortunately between marketing and sorry, the whole family is making noise. Now everybody's going to be, we're all, making noise. we're all sequestered in our homes, man. This is our current reality. Okay. Nobody's <laughs> alone. Feel here. bad for some people though. Cause some people don't like their families. I mean, I'd hope that's not the case for, for everybody, but I know for a fact, there are some people that do not get along in their house and I pray for them. I do. Here's, I do. Here's the theory that I'm hearing that, when all of this is said and done, you know, later this year, there's going to be two spikes. 
It's going to be baby spikes. Oh, yes. And it's going to be divorce proceeding spikes. <laughs> this time <laughs> together is going to do one or the other for people. So. Uh. Oh, my God. I never thought of the divorce part. But, yes, I did <laughs> think about the fact that there's going to be some extra babies being made right now. For likely, sure. Likely. Yeah. That's yeah. hilarious. Yeah. But, yeah, anyways, I do think it's like a two-four. Like, people people are are creatures of convenience. I used to be one myself. Um, and, um, and again, they just don't know. And, but uh, it, that's why I'd love to get into education in the, like the, the system, um, you know, with the school boards and whatnot, because I mean, we still have um, in the schools, tons of sugar just being handed out to kids. Like you wouldn't believe mm-hmm. like, and now there are rules about it. Like my kids school, they, they have rules that there's only like, I think two days out of the year where they're allowed to give kids like sugar. But let me tell you, Nobody follows those rules because my kid comes home with a lollipop all the time and not just like a, you know, normal little lollipop. No. Do you remember those like compressed sugar ones? Ooh. It was like those pressed sugar, Delicious. you know, the powdery one. Oh yeah. yeah. I remember them. Yeah. Yeah. My daughter loves them and it comes home quite often with those. And so I found myself last year. Um, yeah, it was last year. Um, it was uh, the first like week of school every day that kid was coming home with a lollipop. Really? And I'm just like, I want to be the one who treats my kid. And, sure. and I have a whole theory about treating, by the way. But, um, you know, I want to be the one who allows her something like that if she would like it. Um, but I can't do that if she's already having too much. And so what I did is I ordered a, a, one of those big, like, novelty, like, toy treasure chests, you know, with, like, the finger traps and the, and yeah, the yeah. little googly eye, like, glasses that the eyes kind of pop out sure. and, you know, whistles and rubber balls and stuff. And I brought that to the teacher and I was as polite as I could possibly be. I said, I love that you're rewarding the kids for good behavior. I absolutely do. I thought maybe you might like to reward them with toys. (laughs) Instead of, I didn't, I didn't bother saying anything about the sugar. I just thought, here we go. Instead, here you are. Very subtle, very subtle, Uh, subtle, not subtle, but yeah. How much of a problem is sugar? Sugar is a big problem. Um, Yes, sugar is a big, big problem. And obviously we've got issues with diabetes as well, but we all know that um, uh, it also increases inflammation um, in your body. And inflammation is actually what kills you Mm -hmm. because your body is trying to constantly combat that inflammation. And so if you reduce your sugar intake to say less than 10% of what you're eating, and that's not talking, I'm not saying get rid of all sugars. Sugar is not a bad thing. Um, It's just it's what you do 98% of the time that keeps you well, that, you know, don't worry about the 2% or the 10% as other people say, I like to say 2% because I'm pretty strict with myself. Um, but happily strict with myself. Um, and the sugar in the schools is a big problem because we're not teaching our future generations anything right now. And, and that's going to continue the cycle of not knowing how to look after yourself. Right. Right. Yeah, it's interesting. Sugar is the is the next frontier, I think, because people are beginning to understand cigarettes and, you know, some of the more obvious stuff, but sugar is so prevalent. And I mean, people drink, I'm guilty of this too sometimes, people drink so much pop, let's say, or alcohol, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, I mean, water is the thing that we should drink. But we're so used to high octane flavors and there's a certain amount of comfort in those things that it's very hard to turn people off of them. And I think they don't understand how how toxic sugar is. I'm only now beginning to understand this myself. Right. And a lot of it is too, is that um, the way our bodies are designed is that, um, you know, the second you have some sugar, right, your pancreas just goes nuts, producing some insulin to take care of everything, right? Right. Um, But then that's when you have your blood sugar drop, right? Afterwards, you have this little crash. And so that says, sends a message to your brain that says, go find some more sugar. And luckily, we live in a society that is like got billions of calories per like meter, like it's, I know I'm over exaggerating, but you know, you know, thousands and thousands of years ago as hunters and gatherers, you know, we had maybe like, you know, only we, like a, a, only so many calories per acre. And we had to, we had to walk to get them right. <laughs> or run. I, exactly. Oh. And so, and here we are with just everything here. And so when our brain says, you got this blood sugar drop, go get, go get some more. Um, 
you know, it just creates a, a cycle. And that's why we're getting tired in the afternoon. You need that pick me up. It becomes a habit on top of, on top of the, the messages that the body sends. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's a vicious cycle. Yeah. And, uh, a couple of simple nutritional changes can make a huge difference for that. Yeah. I, I, well, there's a few things that, again, that I, I stand by principle wise. And again, that's one, it's far more important to get the things you do need than get rid of the things, but it is a great idea, no matter what, to reduce that sugar intake for sure. But I also really recommend to people is to breathe. Hmm. Um, and, uh, and it sounds so simple because we do it every day, but uh, the problem is, is that we're breathing very shallow, hmm. right? We're breathing. Um, and, and then of course we have a very stressful, stressful lives around us. Right. And so our primal brain perceives danger and really allows for that shallow breathing. What you need to do every so often, is just, just stop and take some deep breaths and exhale those deep breaths. And, and what that's going to do is going to, uh, tell your body that you're not in danger. Hmm. And, and that relaxes everything <laughs> and, and it just, it reduces your stress. And if you're less stressed, you're less likely to go and find that sugar. Right. Plus there's also a massive hormone cocktail that goes through you when you're stressed, right? Yeah. Toxic, uh, hormones and everything happens and you need to release those things somehow, right? And if they're going through your body all the time, sometimes they get released in destructive kinds of ways or they cause havoc on your system, right? Absolutely, yeah. I know you're a big meditation proponent, which, yeah. I mean, the deep breathing leads us to that. Were you always a meditator or is that new for you? No, I've actually always been oh, um, you, yeah? since, my, since my teen years. Actually, this is sort of where I feel my life has come full circle, is that because I was too afraid to be on stage and I was too afraid to you know, put myself out there, I was always um, doing everything else that in my mind compared to me in the same feels, you know, gave me the same love, the same yeah. passion for life. Um, and that for me was um, meditation and volunteering and just being part of my community and, uh, and really doing what I could to help others. And so when I was really young, that's what I did. I went out my community. I volunteered for many different organizations. Um, my actual career background before music was in special events. I worked as a non in the nonprofit sector. Um, I had actually been um, a chairperson for Big Sisters in Toronto before they amalgamated with Big Brothers. That's how many years ago that was. Um, and so, um, yeah, my whole life has come back full circle. And I, this is why I really do feel like, um, one, I needed to go out and be a musician to do that to come back here. This is, it brought me right back here. And, um, and so, yeah, meditation has been a huge part of my life. Um, it's, um, because my anxiety was so strong. I didn't even like speaking in, in front of, uh, like business meetings. Um, we had, um, or when it came time to discuss grant writing, like when the meeting started, like, and then people are looking at me, you know, or I had to train volunteers and, um, you know, I found that, uh, a huge source of anxiety as well. So yeah, meditation was my ticket. Um, and I would do these little mini 10 second meditations before any kind of perceived performance, I guess. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. So ever since I was about 16, 17 years old, meditation has been huge for me. What, um, what's your meditation technique? I know it's easy to complicate this. I'm not a great meditator. I have monkey mind and I have a hard time controlling it. I like that you say monkey mind. Well, I, I really do. It's a problem. Um, so tell me, tell me about your method of doing that. Well, well, first let's just address your monkey mind before we go <laughs> on to my technique. Let's okay? address the host. Yeah. Let's address your monkey mind. Sure. And, and what I want to suggest is, is that that's perfectly fine. It's perfectly normal. And, um, I don't want you to, um, think that you're doing it wrong uh, when you have thoughts come in. And what I would suggest to you is when you're in your meditation, in your practice, however you do it, um, I just want you to acknowledge that you're having a thought. Just, just acknowledge it, smile and let it pass. Give it permission to be there for a second, but then reorient your focus back to say you're breathing, right? So Thoughts, like the, the whole purpose of meditation isn't to stop thinking, you know, it's, it's so that you can 
focus on what you want to focus on, right? So some of us, we really believe that I'm just going to focus on my breathing. That's it. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Um, But that's a great way to bring yourself back to your intention Mm. is to focus on your breathing. Um, Now, when it comes to my technique anyways, um, I'll talk to my little 10 second technique because it's the one I actually use the most. And I think that it would be great for most people because it doesn't take anything more than 10 seconds. Um, But it does take practice, which is again, so you're going to breathe in for a count of five. And you're just going to hold it at the top and you're going to let it go. And you're going to do that three times basically. So it's 10 seconds, 10 seconds. I know. So it really does add up. But when you get to the point where you feel relaxed, I like to add in, it's like a, it's like a a combo of breathing and thinking. Mm -hmm. And again, people mostly think you don't want to think during meditation, but you do when you have an an intention. Right. Uh, And so I will um, split my thought into two pieces. Uh, So if say I am, I apologize, the kids around having fun right now. Um, Slice of life. I know. Yes. Um, so I will split up my thought in into two, basically. And um, so say I'm coming to my performance. I'm going to be on stage. I'll breathe in and I'll say, I am enough. And then this, and as I breathe out, it would be, for this performance, right. you know, however I want to split up and that might not be what you want to say, but for me, um, you know, it could be, I, um, I'm going to have a great performance, but I am not my performance, hmm. you know, uh, just uh, things, small little things like that, that you can just sort of coax into your brain, um, the cognitive ideas that you want there before you begin something. So just 10 seconds, breathe in half your thought, breathe out the other half yeah, I see. and you're done nice and easy. Yeah, cool. It's funny. I mentioned my monkey mind and you talked about watching each thought kind of float by. It's not, I have this image of Huckleberry Finn on the river. It's not that. It's a parade. It's a Disney cartoon with the bass drum and the cymbals. It's a long, long parade. So I have to watch the whole parade walk by. That's the so image. You, you I got have. a big monkey mind. Oh, it's chaos in there, man. I tell you, it, but it's okay. It's okay. I, I don't. I try have you to... thought of journaling? Oh, oh man, journaling those 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 thoughts. Get them out of your head. You know the um, the morning pages. Yeah. You know about this exercise? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can't do that. Uh, it it causes me more anxiety than it relieves, actually. Writing for me is a whole like coaching session. I, I have a, I have a troubled history here with writer's block and with a lot of stuff that we don't have time to go into right now. But <laughs> yeah, I've tried the journaling and eh, not necessarily my thing. But um, while we have just a couple more minutes, tell me about this coaching practice that you have opened and and who you're working with and what you're doing. Yeah, so right now I'm actually working uh, with uh, some writers groups uh, and some young musicians. And actually, I just started working with some dancers. Oh, great. Um, Yeah. And so what I'm helping them with, first off and foremost, is their health. Because again, I believe you can't reduce your anxiety and you can't build your confidence if you don't feel good in your body. So I believe that that is the foundation. And here goes the child chasing a dog. Okay. (laughs) Um, (laughs) It's a great podcast. You're going to never invite me back on again. Um, (laughs) Anyways, um, so being distracted, where am I right now? Hmm. Oh, no, I'm asking you. I got distracted because of the child and the dog and the husband who are now right beside me. We're we're talking about your coaching practice. You're working with dancers. Yes, yes. And their health. Thank you. I'm and so sorry health. about that. Right. And their health. Everyone's disappearing now. Thank God. They couldn't just do that for me to begin with, but there they go. Anyways. Um, and so <laughs> I start off with their health um, and then uh, we build onto a program uh, that's designed for them. And so we go through what is it about their situation that is causing them anxiety? Um, and, and again, it could be, and we really want to dive into the, the surroundings all around it, um, of, you know, of, of when they're feeling an anxiety. And, um, it's quite remarkable that 
some of them feel anxiety the minute that they know a performance is coming. That performance could be six months down the road and it yeah. doesn't matter. And so we need to come up with strategies and, and, and cognitive tools that will allow for them uh, to not ignore their anxiety, but put it in its place. It has the right place. And, and anxiety is, you know, you can say people are nervous, which is just excitement. It's just arousal, right? Mm -hmm. And we want a little bit of arousal for our performances. In fact, people would argue that you can't have peak performance without a certain level of that arousal or nerves, if you will. I don't like the word myself. But it's energy, right? Energy, exactly. And that's why I like the word arousal, because that's exactly what it is, energy. And so I help them find that place and I help them find their tools. And there's so many tools, as you know, I mean, there's there's visualization, there's reorientation, there's reframing. And reframing is one of my favorite things. Um, and I've become very good at it in life, which is basically just taking note of a belief I have. And maybe I don't like that belief. And I just instantly choose to change it. And, you know, it, that takes, you know, you have to cultivate that skill. It doesn't sure. just happen overnight. Um, but that is one that I had to cultivate in order to be a performer. I had to change my beliefs and I just got very good at doing it instantly. And that's what reframing is. Um, it sounds like magic, you know, but, and then of course there's rituals and that's actually why I, I named my business ritual life artist. I was going to ask you that question. Yes. Go yeah. on. Because um, I, being a performer, I actually developed these little rituals, like my 10 second little centering kind of technique. And, um, and maybe I had some lucky charms, we'll say, um, you know, there's all sorts of different things that, that people, people have and do. But I, um, when it came to the 10 second centering, I'd like to say that it was more of a ritual recitation sure. of an incantation. So it was kind of magic in my mind. But then I also did like a visualization technique um, quite often, which was um, I would just see that there was two roads in front of me and the one road I knew, but this road to the right had something different to offer, something better and something exciting. And so I would always picture myself taking that other road and I was always, I could always feel I was in my um, sneakers, um, <laughs> which are the all-star sneakers. Of course. And, and so, you know, I would visualize myself just dancing and having a great time and saying, yes, 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 yes. And that put me into a much better place to get on stage. And so I help people find these rituals and these tools and use them ritually great. to build their self-confidence and to, and to lower the anxiety and increase their health, like ritually wild about health. That's me. Awesome. That's wonderful. And it's, it's so exciting. I'm fascinated by people who make huge changes because it's possible to do, right? Yeah. I was wondering why you want to talk to me, <laughs> but then you said, so, all right. You've made a huge change. You were dying. Yep. And, and now you've, you've learned to let go of an identity you had, yes. which was not serving you, right? And exactly. You've been open enough to be led into this new identity, which has changed your life. Absolutely. A lot of people would like to change their lives. They don't know how. They don't know what stops them from doing that. So when I see a story like yours, I get excited to share it, right? Well, thanks. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to share. I'm glad you did, and thank you. I have two more questions for you. They're very quick. Ooh, all right. Number one, are we going to see Tanya Marie Harris on stage again? I really do hope so, um, but very differently. Yeah? I would like, uh, and I'm working on it. Um, slowly because this involves adding new skills. Um, and uh, I'd like to be in a theater production, Great. musical specifically. Yeah. I, I believe that was my original dream when I was younger. Really? That's actually how I found my voice to begin with. And so I feel like as a country musician, though, no one's ever really heard me sing for real. Hmm. And, uh, and for real for me would be those powerful meaningful songs from all those musicals I loved growing up. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So I hope so. And, and what I mean by taking steps towards that is I take a theater jazz class. Do you? I do. How exciting. Yeah. I'm just, I'm, I'm preparing myself. One day my daughter will need me at home less. Right. And uh, I can then hit the, uh, the theater rehearsals and, and be, be available for that. So for now I'm not available, but I will be soon. You can trip the boards. That's great. Good yeah. for you. Thanks. I'm looking forward to seeing that happen because, you know, being a full-time per performer might 
not in fact be the best life for you, but music should still be in it. Whatever 100%. your whatever your new life is, it is a passion and people need to exercise their passions. Well, I do work with a young lady uh, and uh, she's a beautiful young lady. I won't say her name at the moment, but she has a uh, huge anxiety, not when it comes to singing, however, mm-hmm. um, but she has some severe learning disabilities. And so we spend some time writing music together. Great. And uh, I feel like I have the patience um, to help her with that. And so I do still have my hand in music all the time. Good. As you should, as you should. Because, I mean, that, that is a gift of yours, too. And, you know, people have to learn how to use their gifts in the right way, in a way that's healthy for them, right? Yes. So terrific. Last question. Uh, for all the people out there who find themselves in the position you were in, which is unhealthy, unhappy, uncertain, what's the first step towards resolving that for them? Something. What I mean by that is, I, I did a post the other day. Um, I used to believe everything was all or nothing. And, uh, and so, therefore, I would do nothing right. because I felt I had to do it all. Right. And the truth is, is you don't. You just have to start with one small habit, just something. So, you know, um, at the time, I was a heavy smoker. Hmm. Bad Tanya, bad Tanya, I singer didn't know that. smoking. I did I not know. know that about you. Hmm. And, uh, well, I didn't eat all day. So all I did was smoke my cigarettes and drink my coffee. Perfect. And I didn't, I didn't want to quit my cigarettes either because I was afraid of gaining weight. Now, luckily when I, I did quit smoking during my health program and guess what? Lost weight while I was doing it. I lost almost 40 pounds in total. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I quit smoking. So if it's smoking for you, okay, that's a big one to tackle. That's a tough one. So it is. And so if you're looking to get healthier, um, I would start by adding in your water, get hydrated. It's one little thing you know, six to eight glasses of water a day, like, um, you know, write water on your journal or your calendar every day and do like, you know, six to eight little circles so you can check them off because we all feel good. We all get a hit of serotonin dopamine, right? When we check something (laughs) off, it feels real good. So, you know, I would start with something, whether it be water, whether it be breathing, whether it be just trying to add, you know, more fruits and vegetables each day, just start with something. It doesn't have to be everything. Oh, interesting. That's great advice. Thank you. Thanks. I'm going to go let you look after your family as we're all <laughs> isolated here, but um, I'm glad you're back and congratulations on changing things. Well, thank you. I really appreciate sharing. It was real sweet of you to invite me. I'm glad you did. Thank you so much. I'm going to let you go and uh, I'll be watching your journey with great interest. Thanks, John. All right. Talk to you again. Ciao. Okay. Bye for now. Thank you once again, gentle listener, for taking in today's show. If you want to know more about the program, go to www.john-huff.com. That's J-O-H-N-H-U-F-F.com and click on podcast. You can also find the show on Facebook at The John Huff Podcast. If you're an Instagram person, you can find me at JW underscore Huff. If you're a Twitter person, you can find me at at JWSHuff. No matter where you listen to the show, please do me a big, big favor and leave a rating and review. Preferably a positive one. That's all the time we have for today, but I'll be back very soon. Until then, keep your wits about you and remember... Good things happen when you put yourself out there. Bye for now. Got nothing else to say this week.